an incredible brain. We looked at the way it's wired and the brain is the centre of consciousness, of conscious awareness. If we don't have the brain in that awareness state, that is when they're going to take you off of life support. So if that third of the brain, which is your neocortex, your left and right brain, is damaged beyond repair, that is when we cannot survive. Even though that is such an important area, it's more, we are more than just a brain. We are a body, we have feelings, you know, there's all sorts of things happening. Um, we looked at, so far we've looked at the three brains, that we actually have three brains in one. We have the survival brain, we have the emotional brain, we have the thinking brain. And the way the brain is wired and how we develop depends on a number of things. One, it goes back to certainly what is programmed in prior to birth. We have genetic programming. Um, and then when we're born, how that programming is triggered and how it responds depends on the environment. They don't know the exact shift between nature, nurture. You know, how much is genetics, how much is environment? Both of them are important. Okay, so one of the things we need to also look at then is not just the brain, we also need to have a look at the body, that mind-body connection, which is what we started to talk about. So why, what you do with your brain, how come it reacts to the body? You know, you can have something happen in the brain and it can hurt in your big toe and people don't understand that relationship. So what we're going to do is have a look at the brain and the nervous system. Okay, we have an amazingly wired system and the brain has to send information um, from the top of the brain right through to the tips of your toes, to your fingers, to everything. So how does it do that? And I find understanding that is powerful. And anyone who has had a nerve disorder would understand how important that network from the brain to the body is. Um, with the nervous system and there is a, a picture of what you can see as the nervous system in front of you up on the slide you can see that there's a lot of networks going from the brain right through the body the several important ones are one is the central nervous system and that runs down this either side of your spine and you've got a brain stem here that the brain stem connects all of that wiring goes there from your central nervous system it then radiates around the body so what you have, it's a peripheral nervous system, so it goes down the main line, which works, it coordinates the body, then it goes to the peripheral, which goes to every organ of the body. And one of the things that I have noticed that people who have back problems, they might have injured part of their spine, they have a problem in that area because it, it, the nerves radiate. If they have a blocked nerve ending there, you can get pain here. So this is where the whole system is wired and it is very specifically wired. And you can see from that diagram, that wiring goes from the brain. It also goes down through the whole leg system and we have there the sciatic nerve system that if you've ever had sciatic nerve problems, you know what it's all about. It's very painful. Those nerve endings go to the very soles of your feet. So the bottom of your feet have thousands of nerve endings which is why we need to look after our feet. Having a foot massage is like having a body massage. That's how powerful the nerve endings are. We then have the nerves that come right through your, your, your arms and down to the tips of your fingers. So when you touch something, you can pick it up. Someone can have nerve damage and they touch things and they can't feel anything. So this is where the nervous system is a powerful wiring system that we all need for the brain to function and the body to function. Now, there's a, this is goes back, um, this information goes back to an early health reformer by the name of Ellen White. Um, and she wrote this in 1872, which is amazing. She was very inspired. She had to be to know this information because then they did not have the science that we have today. She said, the brain is the capital of the, uh, capital of the body, the seat of all the nervous forces and of mental action. The nerves proceeding from the brain control the body. By the brain nerves, mental impressions are conveyed to all the nerves of the body as by telegraph wires, and they control the vital action of every part of the system. All the organs of motion are governed by the communications they receive from the brain. Now, this was written, as I said, in 1872. 
More recent research now validates what was written, which is even more amazing. So in that, I have taken someone um, who I sort of read about or read of her material. Her name is Babette Rothschild, and she does a lot of research. She did a book called The Body Remembers, because every cell of your body has a memory. Okay, we remember everything, not just visually and emotionally, but every cell remembers what has happened to it. So the, she calls it somatic memory, and that is what they term it. Soma means the body. It's our body's physical cellular memory. Now, she is saying exactly what I've just read that Ellen White wrote. She says, somatic memory relies on the communication network of the body's nervous system. It is through the nervous system via synapses and the synapses are, that join the nerves that information is transmitted between the brain and all points of the body. Okay, so it's a pretty amazing mechanism. Yeah, and I wonder sometimes how we do survive when we have a look at the wear and tear and what we do to our bodies. Okay. Now, I've, a slide I've got up there is an individual nerve cell. Now, we have trillions and trillions of these cells throughout our body. These are the cells that are created when we exercise, when we do things, when we have fun. They're also reliant on the nutrients we put in our system, as well as lots of other things. But an individual nerve cell, as you can see, it has lots of arms and legs. It's like a multi-legged octopus that goes everywhere. And you can see some little dots or little button areas that actually connect. And these are the wiring cells that send through electrical impulses as well as send through biochemical messengers. Now, if you've ever had, say, depression or anxiety, two important messengers, biochemical messengers you hear about are dopamine and serotonin. Right? And this is where doctors will target those. But there's also some very good foods you can do. If you de-stress the system, if we have the right nutrients, it helps the, the brain to have those um, levels of serotonin and dopamine that we need. So it's not just the individual nerve cells, it's actually what travels through these nerve cells. Now these nerve cells connect, so the one you can see sitting there and all those connections that you can see, or arms going out, actually connect to other cells. And uh, under a microscope, of course, they can identify and see these cells, but for us with the naked eye, you would not see it. We just see the mass. But these nerve cells run throughout the brain and the body and right through to the tips of your toes and fingers. So they are important and we need to look after the nerves. If you've ever had a nervous disorder or nerve problems, you'll know how crucial that is. Okay, now we're going to look at a specific branch of the nervous system because this is where a lot of the work I do to balance the mind, the brain, the body works on this nervous system. And you might have heard of the autonomic nervous system and as it sounds, it is automatic, it's autonomic, it's autopilot. We don't have to think about it, we don't have to do it. Okay, we don't have to think, I want to move the muscle or I want to do things. This system is constantly working and it constantly fluxes or moves around. There are the two branches to the autonomic nervous system and you might have heard of these. The first one we're looking at is the sympathetic side of your autonomic nervous system. Physically, it actually runs from the heart area down through to the gut. Okay, down through to that part of you, because the two parts are in different areas. It is wired and connected to your survival brain. And if you remember, the survival brain is the brain that tells us there's danger, we're being threatened, there's a, an alert of some sort. That puts in a fear circuitry. The survival brain is fear-based. It goes to the emotional brain, puts fear in, it goes back through the sympathetic nervous system, ignites your adrenals, your adrenal system. Your adrenals are at the back, just above the kidneys, okay? And when you have a threat, when the brain says something is threatening me, it activates your adrenaline and cortisol. Now, how long does it take for you when that door slams to get the adrenaline going? nanoseconds, isn't it? So it's a system that even though we're looking at different parts wiring through, it happens instantly. And it's just as well or we would not survive. So the sympathetic nervous system is what we call the fight-flight system. And the fight-flight system, if we keep it on all the time, the wear and tear is horrific. Okay, so if I'm running on adrenaline cortisol energy, I'm going to keep driving myself. 
And if I can't use it, if I'm not using it and I can't do anything with it, it's like we're, we're running on the spot, then it goes into what's called a freeze mode. Okay, and when we freeze, that's when we can't action. A lot of the disorders I work with are freeze disorders. Trauma disorders, anxiety is a freeze disorder. Uh, and by freeze, and, and same with depression, I'm talking about the nervous system is in a freeze mode. It cannot go anywhere, but it's revving that engine. So the sympathetic nervous system is like a car with the accelerator going, okay? And you have the revs up. Now, when you actually can't use it or you go into this freeze space, what happens? It's like putting your car up on blocks, revving the engine full throttle, and you're not going anywhere. So as you know, that is incredible wear and tear. That's how they test engines and see how long they will last for. Um, it amazes me that as human beings, we last as long as we do. Because I find when you activate that part of the nervous system, um, and you keep activating it, you know, some people will be years before they finally do a burnout. So we are resilient on one level, particularly if you have inherited a good constitution. Okay, so the sympathetic nervous system is essential. It activates that part of you, it's going to get you to, to fight or flight under duress. Now the parasympathetic nervous system, and that is in around this area here. It's like a, a ledge, you, if you can just quite see it on the skeleton on the left on your slide. It's down the bottom part, there's some nerves and that that work on that area. So you've got this connected to the sympathetic. Now, apparently we actually fluctuate between the two of them. So during the day, you're th that part of the nervous system is moving around. It's going from one to the other, it's active. Now your parasympathetic nervous system, that has the ability to put the brake on, okay? Because when you're revving the engine, you want to put the brake on. You want to stop it, but you've got to take your foot off the accelerator. So this is how you can start understanding this nervous system. Um, it's the part of you that revs the engine or it slows it down or it stops it. I find people who have disorders where they can't slow down or they're anxious um, or functioning that way is they can't put the brake on. So part of what I do is help people put the brake on. So what are some of the things we can do to put the brake on? There's lots of things. Uh, just a few of them are uh, just doing, doing some proper breathing. It will slow it down, okay? By being out in nature, I find it puts the brake on. By having a nice swim, going to the beach, you know, all these things put the brake on. But somehow we have to slow that part of the nervous system down and get off revving that engine. Okay, it's a, a very powerful process. So now we've got the head and we've got the three brains that are connected to that part of the nervous system. That information travels down the spine and then is connected and it does it instantly. Okay, so the other thing that we can look at with the nervous system is what is stress? So if we have a look at that factor, you know, what would you consider stress to be? Stress is usually, it is your physiological response to the stressor. It's what we do when we are in something and how we react to it. The door slamming, obviously, it, it's very powerful and we're going to feel the adrenaline surge. And you can feel it. So you can feel it coming from here up through here and it hits here. And then you go, whoa, I can feel that. Okay, so that is how the stress factor works. It presses that button and it ignites particularly the survival brain. That's what we want to do. People who have in disorders like chronic fatigue and inflammatory disorders live a lot on their survival brain and on the sympathetic nervous system. They do not have balance. Now there is a very good overview of stress and what stress is. We have what is called the three stages of stress and that was put together in 1950 by a gentleman by the name of Hans Seal. He used to, to study the system. It is still a well-used overview today. A lot of researchers still work with this and people who teach about stress. So the three stages of stress, and we're just going to go through these. The first one is the alarm reaction, okay? And the alarm, that's when the alarm bell goes on, okay? And that is that part when I said we're driving down the road and someone comes out and nearly hits you, that is the part of you that responds. The alarm reaction occurs. That means your survival brain has picked up danger, danger, my life is threatened. It then sends 
the information down to your sympathetic nervous system, which kicks in the adrenal, so we then have high adrenaline and cortisol. Okay. Take that example from the car if you're driving down the road. If you don't stop and get the body to settle, you're going to be running on that survival brain and nervous energy where you're going to be overreacting. And you've probably all done that where you find that you're driving along and you had that near miss and you're waiting for something else to come and get you and anything that moves in your peripheral vision, you start reacting. You overreact. Okay. A very simple way of turning that volume down, of reducing that effect and putting the brake on is to take a deep breath. So when you take a deep breath and let it out, it calms the adrenals. It puts on the brake. Okay. But we've got to take our foot off revving the sympathetic nervous system. So what do you think might rev, rev that engine? Our thinking brain. You know, we go, oh, I could have died. I nearly got hit by that car. What if? And we drive around what ifing and starting to rev that engine more and more and more. So taking the deep breath will calm the adrenals, but if we don't stop the thinking and we go, hang on, that's over, I'm okay, I'm driving, I'm feeling calmer now, I'll be okay. If we don't do that, we're going to keep revving the engine, that sympathetic nervous system. So now we're looking at brain-body balance. How do we do that? Okay, now the problem is with the alarm reaction, if we don't get off alarm, if we don't get off that reaction, what can happen is we go into a space where we are constantly revving the engine and we've got overload of adrenaline and cortisol. Adrenaline and cortisol are um, inflammatory markers. They actually work a, a, a lot in opposite ways. Our body is what we call a homeostasis system and that means it wants to constantly balance. Okay, for example, if you get a bit cold, the liver is the heat generator. It gets the body shaking and trembling to heat the body up again. That's a thing. Our blood sugars are a good example. Okay, so when we um, have too many sugars in our blood, it shoots up our blood sugars. Our um, pancreas is going to put in a lot of insulin to try and counterbalance it. So your system is constantly in a state of balance. But when you stay on the alarm reaction, you're putting it out of balance constantly. And that means you're um, not just your breathing rate's out of balance, your whole system's out of balance, your blood sugars are out of balance, um, everything else is out of balance because your brain is now being compromised. It's trying to survive. And a lot of people stay on that. They never take that system off, whether it's workplace stress, whether they've had stress and trauma in their childhood. I see a lot of people in the from the armed forces who've had a lot of stress and cannot switch it off. They've switched it on and they can't switch it off. So one of the things you have to assess, are you revving the engine too much? Are you constantly on this alarm reaction and you've got too much adrenaline and cortisol? Adrenaline gets the brain thinking. When you get an adrenaline surge, it usually comes through that nervous system up here and often we, we go like that, we hold that area there, or you'll find what will happen, you then feel it go straight to the brain and you can feel the brain revving up and it's doing overtime. You're, you're thinking rapidly because it's a threat, there's something threatening you. And even if there's not a threat and you're still revving the engine, you're still looking for threats. So this is where we have to slow it down. Cortisol actually does the opposite thing, it slows the brain down. Okay, but again, we don't want overload. And it's meant for a specific purpose, to deal with the stress and to deal with the threat and then switch off again. Cortisol, um, I was reading an interesting article about it and said that when you have an accident, people who've been in an accident or in a stressful situation that is life-threatening have found that it's like they see their life before them or they actually see it in slow motion. That is the effect of the cortisol. It actually slows everything down and it does it in that instant to try and slow it down to help the brain cope with that event. Okay, so that's how it works. Now, what happens when you have too much adrenaline and cortisol? You stay in what's called the resistance stage. In other words, you are maintaining those high levels. And I would say a huge percentage of our population would be doing that. You know, how many people do you know that don't stop, that never slow down, that are constantly reacting to things, whether it be in the workplace? And how many relaxed people do you know? And maybe have a look at yourself. 
Are you one of those people that keeps revving that engine? Do you take time to relax and to take the brake off? If not, or to put the brake on, I should say. If not, you're going to be in resistance. And that means maintaining those high adrenaline and high cortisol levels causes massive inflammation. One, it inflames the brain. So that means every cell is not balanced. That nice um, pH balance is gone. You've got highly acidic state. You've got high inflammation. And you get a lot of toxic buildup. So that means now we've got a system that is toxic. Now, what has to deal with that? Certainly the liver and the kidneys do. So this is why we end up with these problems. When you're in this stage, um, or certainly in the alarm reaction and resistance, what happens is your stomach produces a lot of acid. You've got a high acid buildup. It pumps it in. Okay? It's not until you relax down it stops doing that. So that means if you're eating, if you've eaten a meal and you're in a stressed state, it's like having a bit of lead in your stomach half the time. You wonder why you've got digestive problems. So you can see, and what do you do if you go to the chemist or you go to the doctor, gives you an antacid? It's only treating the symptom. We have to treat the cause. We have to switch off the alarm reaction. Okay. So if we maintain that resistance over a long period of time, you don't have a lot of wear and tear on the cells, on the system, um, and this is where fatigue sets in. Okay. And you go into the third stage, which is the exhaustion stage. So that means your adrenaline and is causing fatigue and burnout. And you've probably all heard of that, people who've had a collapse, uh, mental, emotional collapse, or they've had a burnout of some sort. And that is because of these three stages. So what you have to learn to do is get off the alarm reaction and stop generating it the whole time. And that means you've got to put effort in, but you have to put the right effort in. And this is why people don't understand. They go, oh, what, you know, if I take five minutes out, what good will that will do? but it's doing it consistently. It's getting off that alarm reaction. And we're going to, as we go through the series, we will be spending more time doing that. Um, at the moment, it's more understanding that brain-body relationship and how the nervous system works. Okay. Now, one of the things in the alarm reaction, we go fight or flight. Okay? And that's a healthy reaction. We have to escape the threat. Okay? But if there is no threat, where do we fight or flight to? Okay? If the, the trauma or that stressor has been so overwhelming and the brain cannot deal with it, the brain does things like dissociates, disconnects. A good example of that is um, when you're driving, driver's dissociation. How often you go, hang on, I think I missed my turn off. Or did I go through those lights? And that is when we are um, in the space where we're too focused and the brain tends to shut off. Okay, when we're in high adrenaline states, we can actually do that to try and deal with it. Uh, I find children who have had trauma in their childhood learn to dissociate. You know, they might, and often their school report is, oh, you know, if they didn't daydream so much or they applied themselves more, they would do really well. It's not about intelligence, it's about brain function. So we all have those moments. If you're a bit too tired, what do you find yourself spacing out? Okay, so this is an example of what can happen um, with the brain when it's compromised. Now, that adrenaline and cortisol puts a lot of energy in the system. And if we cannot fight or flight the event, what happens? We go into what I termed before as a freeze state. Okay. Now, there's a very good example in nature of what the freeze is. And there are a very good group of researchers in the US who study and look at trauma, and I'm fortunate enough to be able to listen to them, uh, read about them, and I've learnt a lot. And one of these researchers who works with trauma said he gave a good example in nature. Now, when an animal is being hunted, okay, so you have an animal, you have the predator, and it might be the deer and um, the lioness catches up, that animal quite often goes into what's called a drop. Now, that drop is a freeze state. Their whole system shut down uh, because it was overloaded. It's what they call the more primitive state of the brain that shuts down to cope. And it does it for several reasons. One, because to escape the pain, but two, because it can't deal with the event and it doesn't know what to do with it, so it does the shutdown. Okay? When it's, you know, and, and it also is a way of trying to fool the predator. If you shut down, you're not going to be a attacked. Right? And this is what, it's human nature. How often have you decided you just want to melt into the background because you can't deal with what's happening? You want to do that shutdown. And this is an automatic response. 
In nature, when the animal does the drop and the freeze, when it starts to come out of it, because sometimes that predator doesn't eat the animal, what it will do, it will go away. It might have already had lunch and it thinks it will come back later. It might go to get the kids to bring them to have a feed later on. It will walk away and what will it will do, that animal will start to come out of the freeze. Now when it comes out, it actually shakes, shivers, trembles. It has very heavy breathing. And they've actually filmed animals, one, a, a polar bear that was darted at one stage for research purposes, and when it was coming out of it, because it went into the freeze state because of the fear it had, it was actually on its side finishing the run. Okay, so it was actually still escaping the threat. And when it got up, it shakes itself off, right, after it went through the shaking, trembling, and it is now discharged the freeze energy that the adrenaline and cortisol had left. Okay, so nature has a way of getting rid of that buildup, right? But unfortunately, or fortunately for the animal, they don't have a thinking brain, so they can't think themselves in and out of things. But unfortunately for human beings, when they go through a trauma, because of the thinking brain, they don't just work on automatic discharge, they can actually lock the freeze in. Okay, and this is where we have the resistance. We're blocked in this free state. We get exhausted and then we get very, very sick. We get all these so-called modern day lifestyle disorders happening. Okay, so we want to be able to discharge the freeze and a lot of the work I do is helping people to do that. And there are some quite easy ways to do that. And what it's doing, it's actually getting the foot off the accelerator, putting the brake on in the nervous system, calming the system, because when you do that, the autonomic nervous system will release the charge that you've frozen. So we actually can discharge the past freezes in the present moment. So this is good news for all of us, and because you don't have to have high trauma for this to be a problem. And I guarantee if you have physical problems, you go to your doctor and he says, oh, it's stress or there's nothing wrong with you, I guarantee you've got that freeze locked in. Okay. How much does it take to put in a freeze moment? If you have a child and you tell them they are stupid and they don't have a brain in their head because they just messed up, if that child believes it, they freeze it. They now believe, their belief gets embedded that they do not have a brain, they cannot learn. They will give up and they will not learn. And it's not intelligence, it's because that frozen moment in time put in a circuitry and a wiring that got stuck. Okay. And even if you give them evidence, they'll find reasons why, no, they're not smart. Okay, so how often do we have those sorts of things? So 10 seconds of your childhood can put in a freeze response that we then carry with us. We don't discharge it. I think the closest I would say is that we discharge automatically is after an accident, people have reported that they've gone into shock and they tremble and they shake and they breathe heavily, they sweat, which is the parallel of what happens uh, to an animal when it's coming out of the freeze. So in actual fact, that shock factor can be healthy as long as the person is looked after, kept warm and allowed to follow that process through. So we can actually do that discharge. And I think that is very, very important that we do it. Um, so with your three stages of stress, um, we have bad stress, which is distress. So when we're putting in that bad stress, we have, as I said, the overload of adrenaline and cortisol. We can no longer fight or flight. And that means we go into this freeze. And the freeze state, we need to discharge. Your cells have high acidity, toxins, and inflammation, okay? So most of us are walking around with this stuff happening in our system. Our digestive system becomes highly acidic, and that is ongoing. It's not just a one-off thing. It means we're walking around with all this acid. So why do you think people are, can't digest things or on antacids and, or medication for their stomach? I'm amazed at the amounts of medication people live on these days. In fact, it's rare to find someone who isn't on something. Um, the breathing rate becomes rapid and shallow or hyperventilates, like we over-breathe. So when we hyperventilate and we have an overload of oxygen, the first signs you get are you get very lightheaded. You'll find you feel like your head's lifting off. It's like blowing up the airbed or the balloon. The next step that will happen is you start feeling tightening of the chest, and that's because you don't have enough carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide's a natural ventilant. So haven't we been given an amazing brain and body? Hyper 
hyperventilating can be prevented by having this natural um, part of us that will actually prevent the constriction of your airways. Okay, so what do you do? You go to the doctor and he gives you a puffer when you can't breathe properly because he's giving you Ventolin that's going to open up the airways. Okay, but if you do things like I get people just to cup their hands tightly around the mouth and the, the nose and rebreathe, and I found in helping people do that, I've had people who are hyperventilating in front of me and going into panic, it stops it immediately. Within a minute, they've calmed down, right? Because when the chest tightens over, you start getting um, pain and it's in the area of the heart. A lot of people think that they're actually having a heart attack. You know, and we've actually, where I work, I work at a psychiatric hospital, we've actually sent elderly people to the, the other hospital to get them checked because we don't know. It mimics a heart attack. So it's important that you work with your breathing and we need to have that even breathing happening. So when you're a bit stressed and you're doing the shallow breathing, take a deeper breath in, a deeper breath out and that will help to settle it, okay? Also things like counting and breathing. So breathing calmly, so counting into about three, out to three, settle yourself down. That will put the body and the brain back into balance. It will get you off of that adrenaline reaction because that's, that's the enemy. Adrenaline is your enemy that, ad enemy, that adrenaline and cortisol. So it's very simple to treat these disorders if you know what to do. Um, and it is about the body balance. Okay, so if we are... Uh, if we believe then, for example, if you have a panic attack at a supermarket and you believe that you uh, can't go to a supermarket anymore, you're already setting yourself up for it. And that comes to my next point, which is about our thinking. So if our thinking is negative and irrational, I went to the supermarket last week, this was terrible, I had this thing happen to me, I don't know what's going on, I can't go back. This sets up an anxiety disorder then that we can have and we start getting anxious about having to go shopping or doing things. So you can see how phobias develop and they are all freeze responses. It's because the body is locked, the energy is locked, the adrenal system is locked in and we need to reverse that. Um, the thinking then, what we believe is powerful in setting this up. So if you believe you're going to have a panic attack, guess what? The body believes it too and it will respond. So we're not just doing head down, we're also doing body up because what the body signals are giving to the brain is very, very powerful. It creates muscle tension, we have insomnia, all these things result from this bad stress. Um, the heart rate is up and we have high blood pressure and hypertension. So that means your whole system is being compromised. You're constantly on that edge, you can't settle, you're not sleeping properly and you are stuck in that loop. So what we want to do is try and change that loop. Okay, now we actually have a counterbalance. We can have bad stress, I call it distress. The term for good stress is eustress. Okay, so this helps to balance the system, which is what we want. So if you have you stress or good stress, what does that mean? I say, well, what's your good stress? And people go, well, stress is stress, but the body can have a good response to the stressor. If you go on a holiday, okay, it's a good stress. I love going on holidays. I went on a three-day cruise recently and it was a great holiday because no phones, I couldn't, you know, no one I knew. It was just a great time to chill out and to get away from it all, okay? But in doing that process what we have to do is realize we have lots of good chemicals then okay so when we have good stress we have a chemical called endorphins and endorphins are happy hormones they are two at least they say two or hundred um, times more than the impact of if we take morphine or those sorts of things that help to bring us down to kill pain they're a natural antidote to pain um, people who laugh a lot feel less pain, even if they've got a pain problem, because it gets the endorphin system going. So you stress gets your endorphins going. Now, when it comes back to the holiday, I know getting there and getting to where you're going on time, catching your flights or whatever, packing your bags is a stress factor. It's not always a good stress, right? Coming home is another distress. You've got to go back to work and your holiday's over. So you can see how we can have distress, you stress, distress. Um, it works that way. But what you do with your distress, if you try and create more of the good stress, the you stress, so what do we have to do? 
okay, increase our endorphins. You know, wonderful study they did is on pet therapy and what happens to the system. And they w took dogs, a, a, a therapy dog, to a home with elderly people and they, of course, wired it up and took blood tests of the dog and the person. And they found what happened that when the person was interacting with the dog and patting the dog, their endorphin levels increased dramatically. All those happy hormones kicked in, their mood elevated, they were more upright in how they were functioning. Well, guess what? The dog had the same response. Isn't that amazing? So the animal was getting the endorphins by interacting with that person as well, which is why when, for example, dogs are wonderful because you go home, they wag their tail and they're happy to see you, they're getting lots of endorphins. And I find when you want to calm yourself down, this is one way of putting the brake on to that uh, part of the nervous system that is revving the engine, your sympathetic nervous system, go and sit with your pet if you've got a pet. Go and interact. Go and visit somewhere that where they've got animals and you can pat them and touch them because the animal will help to calm you down. You know, it's, it's an amazing thing I find. Pet therapy cannot be underestimated. People who actually have pets live a lot longer. They, have, they, they get through stress a lot more. So you can see how the brain and body responds, not just within itself, but to external factors. Okay, so we want a healthy fight flight response. So when you've got good stress, it's much healthier, and that means the energy flows, it does not freeze. Okay, you have fun, you're enjoying yourself, and don't you feel much better? You come home and you feel relaxed, and you can feel that openness, because you've now flowed your energy, you didn't freeze it. Come home from your holiday, and you remember it, and you feel fantastic, you go to work with all the stress, and you come home ready to kick the cat and yell at everyone. <laughs> and that's because of the stress. We've just gone the other way. So how can you challenge yourself to put in more good stress, you stress? Okay, when you have the good stress, your digestive system loves you. It will work well. well. You don't have that acid flowing, right? You're absorbing nutrients. You're able to function really well on all levels. Okay, your breathing rate is normal and healthy. You're not hyperventilating, you're not over-breathing, you're not holding your breath. You know, I get people who are stressed say, you know, what are you doing with your breathing? Oh, I'm not breathing. <laughs> well, of course they're breathing or they would be not alive, they would be dead. But what they're doing is they're shallow breathing in a way they don't feel like they're breathing. So I get people to start to stop and think and breathe. So this is what I'm asking you to do. You have to stop and take a big breath in and let it out. Do not wait for the stress levels to get high. You can be practicing this when you get up in the morning, when you go to bed at night, fresh air, big lung full of air, let it out slowly and you'll get a much better sleep. Okay. When you are in a relaxed state and you've got more stress, the muscles are relaxed, your thinking is positive and more rational. Okay. So you think about when you have your good days and you're functioning well, you're relaxed. Doesn't it flow? Don't you pick up on things? You can think clearly. Um, you'll find you remember things a lot easier. Life can be very, very good. So what we want is that good um, thing happening. The good sleep cycle comes from having that balance. If we've got adrenaline in our system, there is no way you're going to get a good night's sleep. You'll be going to bed and your body and your brain is doing overtime. So this is where, again, slowing it down, getting off of that stress cycle is powerful. When you are having good stress, you are having that homeostasis that I talked about. Your body and brain are balancing. All of the organs in your body are starting to balance and to settle and they flow. And that is when the healing process occurs. Okay? People who actually do a burnout sometimes go to a health retreat. And I know we've got a few good health retreats around and they come out feeling amazingly good and they might do what we call a detox and get rid of a lot of that stuff in our system from the stress, the toxins, the acids, the build up in our system, they get rid of some of that, they start digesting their food, they're getting nutrients in, um, they're drinking enough water and fluids and they are feeling good again. So what we want, we want the body to be in balance, we want that level of homeostasis uh, because if not, we are going to be suffering the whole time. A crucial part, let's have a look at how do we get off that um, imbalance within the autonomic nervous system. How can we get take the foot off the accelerator with your sympathetic nervous system and put the foot on the brake? Okay, This is important. A very powerful way of doing this is connected to the heart. 
because when you have a stress attack, when the adrenals kick in, it comes up here and it goes through, but often we swallow it, we stop it at that point. And what you're doing, the first organ they found when they do research that is compromised with stress and trauma is the heart. The second organ to be compromised are the lungs. Okay, then the other organs of the body follow. So have a look at our rate of heart disease and heart attack in our society. It has risen humongously to the point where young people are having heart attacks or having heart problems. Okay, so this is all to do with what we've been talking about. So what we want to do, if you work from the heart, it works well. There's a lot of good research at the moment and there's a particular group that I have found in America that has specifically researched the heart um, and what happens to the brain-heart connection. And that group, they're called HeartMath, do research specifically on that. And what they have found is with the heart, the heart rate itself and how the heart beats sends signals to the brain. And they have found that the, the heart talks more to the brain than the brain does to the heart. Okay, so this means that your heart and brain are constantly communicating. Every beat, every flutter, the brain interprets. Well, you can guess what part of the brain does the most interpreting, and that's your survival brain and your emotional brain. Your thinking brain is, again, a bit slow. It's the last one in the loop. So what you're getting is you're getting this heart rate variability that is sending messages to the brain to tell them that you're in trouble. If your heart rate is out of balance and what you're getting is this effect and it's all over the place up like this and when you get that the, the brain is in trauma it's in that stress space it's in the free space of something's wrong and it can't work it out okay when you smooth the heart rate out we're not talking about the heartbeat here everyone has a heartbeat and and the doctor will say well let's look at your heart rate and they measure it what i'm talking about is heart rate variability which is from one beat to the next. So what we need to do is have an even variability from beat to beat of the heart. So that means on a graph, if you put yourself on biofeedback equipment and monitor it, you will find that you're getting this effect, right? And that is the perfect breathing rate, heart rate that will switch off that system that is saying red alert, okay? The moment you do that, now to do that, one of the best breathing techniques for breathing, which I find most people are not taught, they're taught to breathe from the diaphragm. And sure, a good breath from the diaphragm in and out will stop the adrenals, but it won't fix the heart rate. Is actually breathing into the area of the heart. So they found in their research that if you get the person breathing here and down and then out to about the count of five and doing this three or four times, what it does, it settles the whole heart system that tells the brain it's okay, it's safe, it's no longer a threat, okay? Now, there might not be a visible threat, but if the heart rate is out of order, it is telling the brain there's a threat even if they can't see one, okay? So people who have a lot of stress and trauma and live in that space have a constant heart rate that is all over the place. The variability is not even. Okay. And I find the most powerful thing you can do is work with that heart rate. Now, when you do that and you smooth it out, what I find happens, you feel energizing in that area. I find you feel a release. And what can happen, the autonomic nervous system has taken its foot off the accelerator, it's put the brake on, and whatever the trauma stress that was sitting in that cellular level, remember the body has a memory, is released when we do that type of breathing. So whatever that person is reacting to, even if they don't know it, they don't remember what happened, they don't remember. And often people say, why am I like this? You know, remember the five senses? We respond to everything in the five senses, sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell. And that person might be reacting to a particular color or a particular item or a particular look they're being given and they have no idea on the thinking brain level. They don't consciously know. All they know is their body's reacting, right? And I get this time and time again. So I get people now to do this breathing and I find it works so well that they can start to feel the actual nervous system calming and downloading, okay? So if you want to treat stress and trauma that is frozen, that is stored, that is a wonderful technique. There are other techniques. Researchers have found different ways of doing this. Um, I heard of a 
a practitioner in America who helps people to get the nervous system trembling and shaking without traumatising the person where they do that release. And that was what we talked about, what the animal does in nature. But for me to go and do that was going to be too costly and too time consuming. So when I kept researching and found this particular research group that looks at the heart, I realised it does the same thing. Okay, so we can all download the stress and trauma that we've accumulated. All right? The more you do it, the, the more effective it is. So when you go to bed tonight, when you lie there, I want you to put your hand over that heart area and feel your heart. And the heart is in the centre, the beat is to the other side. And I want you to breathe in and out of that area and calm yourself down. You will find you'll get a brilliant sleep, that you'll wake up more refreshed, and you have just released that energy that you've been carrying for who knows how long, for years. Okay, and it's not a comfortable place to be in. So in working with the breathing and working with the heart, what they find is from the heart, it works body up to the brain. It helps to turn on your left and right brain. When you breathe from the heart and you even the variability, it switches on left and right brain and gets it back into tune. It gets you off that survival brain. That's pretty powerful when you think about it just to know that that's what's going to happen. That you can now focus your brain in the present moment because your heart is beating evenly and the brain is not distressed. Then the other thing it does from the heart when it does that, it goes down, it does top down where it goes to the nervous system and puts that um, parasympathetic nervous system on and takes the break off of here. Right? You will find that when you have a stress response and you feel that surge coming up, what the heart, when you do that breathing, you'll feel it calming down, you'll feel it dissipating, okay? And this is what we want. So this way we're now connecting the brain, your left and right brain, your thinking brain, your emotional brain, your survival brain, which we need in balance and we need it focused in the present moment because if there's a threat, that's where it's going to be. We want to then get the heart rate down to reconnect the brain, the heart and the nervous system. So now we're working through the whole nervous system, right? So one of the things they found is that your heart is inc incredibly wide. It's a highly intelligent organ. It has like an intelligent computer network in it um, that has been underestimated. And I think science is just starting to catch up with how powerful this mechanism is. And they're finding it's not just a pump that pumps blood around your body. It's actually a message system that works through the whole nervous system to tell the body and the brain what's going on. So this has now added a whole new dynamic into treating people with stress and trauma. And for you to be able to be more relaxed, to have a healthier life, to have a good digestive system, to get the body back in balance. So this is what we want to do. We want to aim at getting you to be able to flow your energy, to get yourself off of that stress response and to be able to not go into those three stages of stress. So instead of going alarm reaction, maintain it, and then we're going to exhaust ourselves and burn out, we can now actually spin it out. We can release that build up and get off of that alarm reaction. So a healthy person, which is what you can all be, is someone who is in the present, who's well functioning, who's balanced, and they're ready to respond if they have a threat, like driving down the road, for example, but they can actually um, be living in the present, because where is quality of life? You know, and I find that spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically, we need to be in the present moment. It's the most powerful place we can.